grateful that uh, Jim has agreed to be our guest speaker tonight. So thank you, Jim. Hi, James. I just I met Jim. I think it was at EIE, and then we arranged to have a chat. And I, when I heard Jim's story, I was like, "Wow, you must be our guest speaker." So for those of you who've never met Jim before, Jim has a background in engineering, which led to numerous business development positions in the oil and gas industry. Uh, Jim made his first angel investment in 2015 and have since invested in 10 or more Scottish startups. So in those number, if I can pronounce it correctly, Alba Gia, 12th Man, Lending Crowd, QuickServe, ShotScope, Sunlamp, Vert Rotors, Vantage Power, Entery Biotics, Pixie. I yeah. probably didn't pronounce no, it. No, I think that's, uh, that's pretty good. <laughs> but Jim found also as an entrepreneur and founded Boxergy in 2017, which aims to provide every home, this is my you know, synopsis of what Jim's working on, every home with a system that will draw heat from the atmosphere. Now, I've probably not done a very good, done it justice, Jim. You're working on such a massive, world-changing project in Boxergy. How would you describe it? So Boxergy is about uh, delivering an AI-controlled uh, network of home heating systems that use um, uh, renewables to heat and power people's homes and it's just a, it's a different way of looking at energy um, and it's a different way of uh, buying energy and this is really to capture the fact that we're switching from coal-fired and gas-fired power generation where the batteries were in the coal and the gas to renewable driven generation where there is no guarantee that those things will supply so what we need to do is to, to be able to take that power when it's available and be ready to buy it. And the people who buy cheap energy are the ones who can take it at two o'clock in the morning. And if you don't have that ability, then you'll pay more for it. And the, uh, so it sounds like, but your system works by drawing heat out of the atmosphere? Yeah, that's right. We use a, a something called an air source heat pump, which is a lot like an air conditioning unit. Um, and it basically takes the energy that's in the air and it can work down to minus 20 plus degrees centigrade. Canada uses them, Norway uses them, you know, people in the uh, far north of Norway actually use these things. So there's, a, there's heat in the air, uh, even at those temperatures. It takes that energy um, through a fan, heats up a very cold liquid, and then we compress that further and add some more energy to it. <clears throat> and basically what we can do is take one unit of electricity and turn it into two and a half units of heat. So Boxergy is going to work because we're cheaper than gas. So that's the only way that new technology really works. It either delivers a really sexy thing or it's cheaper than the last one. And generally, it's got to be sexy and cheaper for it to really take off. And that's what we want to do. So it's, we, our ambition is to sell heat at one pence a kilowatt hour, which is a quarter of the price of gas that's around today. Uh, and we want to do that with green energy as well. So we want to use only green energy to do it. And by that I mean low carbon energy. So. so it sounds like it might solve the problem if we're taking, if we're, if the world's suffering from global warming, uh, your system sucking heat out of the atmosphere, is that going to cure global warming? <laughs> no, that, that's because uh, unfortunately the house is <laughs> leaky and so all the heat just comes out again, you know, it's not used up. So, But what it will do is uh, it'll take some of the 62 million tonnes of CO2 that we emit every year by burning gas in our homes to heat our hot water and heat our homes and to reduce that number. And Boxergy, if everybody changed over to a Boxergy system, we'd reduce that from 62 million to a few million tonnes of CO2. So it's a really impactful uh, system, it's really scalable. There's 23 million gas boilers in the UK and we intend to, to be able to replace every single one of them uh, with a Boxergy system. Wow, that sounds fantastic. So how can people uh, help you uh, to achieve this or get involved in the, uh, in the business? So the single biggest thing for businesses is money. So advice is great, um, you know, our structure's great, uh, but you know, it's the execution of your business plan that really, really matters. And the, the, the catalyst that turns that on and, the, and the, you know, the, the, the thing that powers that is money. So we've got to go out and raise money. So um, I'm in a, a fairly fortunate position. I've, I've raised money in the past um, and I've got money. And, you know, and so why don't I just use my own money? But, you know, 
you'd be a fool to think that because you've done it before that this idea is a great idea. You know, so you have to go and switch that money, switch that idea on by persuading someone else to do it. So we're out raising money at the moment to do that. If we can convince other people that it's a great idea and to part with their cash, then that builds value in the business. Because at some point, you have to, no matter how deep, how rich you are, you have to go and get money. So at some point, you have to convince someone else. So you might as well do it at the start. But it's not just money that, that comes to the table, is it? It's uh, mentoring, uh, their network, yeah. they, they, obviously their uh, expertise coming in to help the business as well. well I think that's a, a good point. So money is not equal. You know, money in and of itself is really important, but there are the you know there are not everybody's money is equal. Like I say, so you know you'll get some people who just give you the money and don't give you any advice, don't give you any connections, can't help you along the way, uh, and be very demanding. Um, and then you get other people who um, you know are going to give you the intangible things like a network, like their experience, uh, and you know help you uh, achieve your goals. And it's quite difficult because at the start, you know, I mean, you know, money's, money's really, really important. So you're very focused on getting it uh, and you have to be pretty uh, strong to, to try and find the right money, I think. So I think money's not, not, every, not everybody's pounds the same. Uh-huh. Yeah. So I, I, I do recall from our conversation before that you were, you're a very... Your background is very pragmatic. I guess engineering, business development. Mm -hmm. You don't really uh, get get overly distracted by minutia or vanity. You're very, you know, you really want to follow the money, and you really want sure. entrepreneurs to be selling stuff. Yeah, I mean, there's a saying in the oil industry: everything before the butt is bullshit. You know, and it's it comes from. You know, you'll you'll hear customers and you'll hear investors say that. So you have to, you know, your metric is or at the moment for our business is to to raise cash. We have to make and listen to people uh, in order to to do that because we have to persuade them. So you have to be um, flexible. You have to listen to them. You have to be prepared to change what you're you're doing in order to raise that money. And you know your sacred cows have to be slaughtered to get there. So you know I don't have all the good ideas, and people in the team have better ideas. Federico sitting over there, and I see I often say that he has most of my best ideas. You know because it's it's a it's a sort of community effort when you're in a startup, and you know if you've not got other founders, then I'd I'd say uh, go and find other founders because it's a really lonely place on your own. I spent my first year bringing on two founders into the business. Um, and that's some of the most important work I could do because when investors look at you, if I can't persuade other people to come and give me their time, uh, you know, then how am I going to invest? How is anybody going to give me their money? So, so that is one of the hardest things for entrepreneurs in Edinburgh. It's not a big city. But people are very busy working on their own projects. Do you, what words of advice would you have for entrepreneurs who who need to find a co-founder? Hmm. So, yeah, so that's a good one. Um, it depends on where you are and who, who you know. Um, and that's, that's a really important thing. So if you don't know them, come to events like this, meet investors, go to people like Jock, who's up next week. Jock's a fantastic guy. I've invested alongside Jock many times, and he knows everybody in the startup community and everybody in the angel investment community. So talk to people like that. I think what you're looking to do with your team is to to find the right balance so don't find you know not everybody's 20 not everybody's 50 uh, not everybody's a go-ahead sort of free thinker you know you need some people who are completer finishers you need some people who are going to argue with you and you need to find opposites in your team I think how you do that you know depends on your network so if you've not got a great network then you have to spend a lot of time just building that network and come to events like this and you had a so when you came down from Aberdeen, you had a, a, a deliberate strategy in building your network and getting to know people. Well, that's right. I, I didn't know anybody in Edinburgh. I'd, I'd worked in Edinburgh until my uh, mid twenties, and then I went to Aberdeen um, in the late nineties, and I worked in Aberdeen and Abu Dhabi for uh, twenty years. 
So when I came back here, I didn't know anybody in business. I didn't know of, of any connections. I knew my friends and my family, obviously, that's well, my hometown. But no one who, who, you know, I could, I, I, I knew, I, I knew one of my co-founders in Edinburgh. He's an old friend of mine. Um, but I didn't know anybody to help me uh, get going. I didn't really have an idea to start a business. I thought I'd just come down here and find a business to invest in that was going, and you know, just take part in that. Um, so when I came down, the route to that was actually I met Jock uh, Milliken, who, who's on next next month, and uh, I invested, started investing through his syndicate. I've invested through uh, Equity Gap, Par Equity, EOS, and the other one, Green Angel Syndicate. Um, and you know, as you do that, you meet the lots of different people, lots of people who've had uh, successful careers or who've had um, exits themselves and who've run businesses. So obviously, you build your network uh, that way. As it turned out, I, I you know, I, I do take part in another business. I'm an investor director for a business called Alba Gaia. Um, but you know, I, I was excited about starting my own business, so I decided to go and uh, do something myself. So. So once you meet people and you think that you're likely candidates for becoming co-founders and you're trying to sell the, the idea to them, but you don't want just anybody to join your team, how do you vet people or how do you know when someone's a good fit for you and your company? Well, that's, that's a really good question. Um, so I knew my co-founder, Jamie Watson, CTO, we met 25 years ago in a, in a shared flat in Brunsfield uh, and a, you know he liked to drink and he's got 107 US patents to his name so he's and he's spent his 25 years in AI and I needed an, an AI person. Uh, Jamie had a, a, has had an illustrious career and he's had an exit himself so um, but he was also earning uh, a really a, 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 a shit ton of money um, at the time and I spent nearly a year trying to hood one come out of the uh, six-figure wealth into six figures salary and get them to come and work for me for nothing um, and you know working I'd say to your mate that uh, you've known for 25 years uh, come and work for me hey, that's a difficult one because I'm not a great you know I'm not an easy person to work with I think uh, at times um, but to tell him that you're gonna give up that many thousands of pounds a, a month uh, and do it for nothing is, is another thing so uh, that was great. We had a relationship. The harder, harder one was um, our co-founder Andrew, who's our um, CFO. So when I, I looked, I looked at the business and I knew what I wanted. I knew that I, you know, I'm a salesperson. I'm a visionary. I'm, I'm this, that, and the other. Uh, and I needed a really techie person. So that was Jamie. And I needed a money person. So I needed somebody who was smoother than I am, because I'm not very smooth in front of money people, and money people like smooth people. Um, and I needed uh, someone who um, could communicate with them in their in their language, and who has experience of raising money, uh, both uh, in London and in uh, in other places. And Andrew fitted the bill. He's raised money in London and raised money in uh, Beijing as well. Um, and. That was important to us because when I looked down the line at Boxergy, Boxergy needs a lot of cash. It's 23 million homes have got to change the boilers off. And that takes us a lot of money to do that. Um, and we're going to change the business model from purchase to um, leasing. So that means there's even more money involved. So we need someone who can help us frame the business and set the business up in that way. So I was looking for someone with that sort of experience and I, I found them through uh, through. Green Angel Syndicate, and I talked to the Nick at Green Angel and Andrew about their business model, and they were, you know, this is a great Angel Syndicate, but they're looking for help with their business model, so they're talking to people who are investing alongside them, um, and you know, so during that conversation, I, I knew that Andrew was thinking of leaving Green Angel Syndicate, and you know, so he came and joined us, and again, he's worked with us for um, over a year for nothing. And he is a very smooth guy. Smooth. Uh, he's different from me, you know. So what you've got to do is not hire yourself, you know, because that would be really boring. So you have to hire different people. So the did you have a so in the conversations and you were trying to persuade these guys to join Boxergy, you were obviously selling the vision and the the dream, the business opportunity. How did you do that? Did you have a vision statement written down, or was it all just in your head? 
Uh, mostly in my head, I think. I, I think, um, yeah. I, I, I mean, that's my gift to, you know, that's, I can sell concepts and it's what I'm, I'm sort of good at. Um, uh, the salesperson in me, you know. Um, but I, I knew what I wanted. I knew, I mean, you begin with the end in mind, you know. So, what does this business look like in three years' time, five years' time? How much money are we consuming? How much money are we making? And, you know, these were just thoughts. I mean, I did commit some of it to paper, but not a huge amount, I'll be honest. I talked about the idea, and I, you know, I, I didn't imagine that it was going to happen in a day. It didn't happen in a day. You know, you have to go and you pitch at people and the quality of your idea shines through or it doesn't, you know. Uh, and you target people and you love bomb them and you get on with them and you spend time with them uh, and you uh, get in their face and, you know, um, I don't know, it, it's just something that, you know, everybody's different. I think some guys will really react well or to facts and figures and other people will react well to, um, you know, the, the dream as it were. And I think because we had a good story to sell because we're doing good, uh, it's massively scalable um, and there's lots and lots of money to be made. So, you know, that's a, that's a really good thing to sell. And the, I mean, I'm interested in t to know how many chats it took to get Andrew uh, on board. Just perseverance is key, months, isn't it? Months and months, six months maybe, of talking to him and meeting him regularly. So, but that wasn't a... Was was that, that like once a fortnight? No, it was probably more often than that. I mean, we would meet um, at events, we meet particularly to talk about it. Um, you know, you just have to be... When you want something, you just have to be really persistent. You know, you have to, if you want it, and you want to work with someone, if they're the right person, <coughs> then you have to just go and get them. You know, it's, uh, I don't know, um, with Jamie it took even longer. But you know, he, I knew he was ready to go um, because I had to listen to his bleating about his, I'm going to take that one out of the video, out the, uh, bleating about his current job, you know. Um, or his old job, rather. Um, and so I knew he was ready to leave, and I just had to persuade him that it was the right thing to do. And you accommodate them, you you, you let them share in the in, in the the success. I mean, they have to be aligned, so they have to have a part of the business, um, and they have to see a route to to making enough money out of it. I suppose. Mm. Well, I think a great example of the probably the best example I've heard of how to. How, how much effort that that takes and how, you know, the, and obviously you had a, a very good result in, in finding those people. Did you ever find a co-founder that wasn't a good fit in the past? Yeah, I definitely talked to, um, to other people. I was pretty sure I wanted Jamie because I've known him for 25 years. Um, and he was, you know, where else are you going to find the business, I mean, I spent a lot of time, I suppose, with Jamie convincing him it was an AI opportunity because it looks like a heating system, you know, it's like Jim Laidlaw and Sons or something like that, you know, and, and it's not, it's a tech business, it's a start, you know, and it's, I had to, I mean, Jamie's a very technical person and I had to try and learn his language to put it, couch it in the terms. Um, Andrew, I spent a bit more time with other people um, looking at them. But I kept coming back to Andrew. I thought he was the right person. Um, he had the right uh, skills and he was interested enough. So that was key. So obviously this is in hindsight. We know the, this is great. But how many people did you talk to in trying to find a co-founder, I would you say? Well, I knew I, I knew a lot of the people in the startup uh, sphere in Edinburgh. Um, I, I, obviously, it, being an investor with them. And, and I've talked, did I, was I looking for them in that, that way? I suppose that we all look at our contacts that way. I, I must have, I've talked to everybody in Equity Gap and you th I thought about a lot of them as co-investors and I still think about people like this, quite mercenary, that you know, you're thinking about what, what people can do to help you with your business. Um, I talked to a guy this afternoon about potentially um, joining us as an advisor. Um, because you know your business with pe business is something with people and it's nothing without it you know mm -hmm. so there's a, a, uh, equity gap's got quite a large membership so you maybe talked to 40 people then was it more than well that? Uh, more than that probably yeah huh so i mean you spend and you know you know a lot of people in the businesses 
as well, you know, and I don't know. I worked with my last business in Aberdeen. We hired 48 people, really good people, you know, um, most of them. But, you know, I can think of three that I would hire straight away again, you know, um, out of the 48. And without thinking, you would go to them. There was a lot of them you would, you know, you go to... Some people emerge as... Um, as you know, you get on with them, they get you, you get them, and they get whatever you're, you're trying to sell or do at the time. Um, and I, I don't know, it's just, uh, I guess that was it, you know, it's the, it's a two-way street, you know, you're talking to them, but they're talking to you. They don't have to join you, they've got other <coughs> opportunities. And it's great to be in a position where, you know, you persuaded people who have options to come and join you, you know, not someone you've just found at a bus stop. Uh-huh, yeah. So I think obviously with, with one one co-founder, you've known them for such a long period of time, but then you give us an example of re recruiting someone who you didn't know so well, hmm. and, and Andrew. So that was, and because a lot of people might not know, especially people who are not natives of Edinburgh, and might not know people who are local um, that long. I think um, the key is finding, knowing what you want from that person. So look at yourself and see what's missing in me and, you know, and be honest with yourself and say, what do I need? You know, if that's, begin with the end in mind, where do I want to be in two years, four years, five years time? And what skills do we need to get there? And, you know, I'm not the best CEO when we're, you know, more than 15, 20 people. It's not going to be me that's the MD of the business because it's not my skill set to run a bunch of people, you know, it's, it's not really, I don't find it really exciting. Um, and you have to find people who, who A, want to work with you and are going to match the spec of what you want. So for me, it was about saying, I know I need a money person. I know I need a technical, a uh, really technical person that understands AI. And those are the foundations of the business, you know, so we can sell something, we can make something and we can get the finance for, for that thing. And those were the three sort of cornerstones that I felt that we needed. And there are others now, there's others emerging that we need, and that's why I was having a conversation today. I'm probably much more fussy uh, now, you know, I think when you start out, it's really about getting a bit of a snowball going, and you have to be, um, you know, you, you still have to be choosy, you know, because uh, you the last thing you want to do is get the wrong founder on. Um, but you know, maybe we've got more choices now. Some people often in this group, we, we, we debate the, the dilemma between getting a co-founder for sweat equ equity, or if, you, if you're struggling to do that, hiring people onto your team. Uh, what advice would you give people who are thinking of, uh, which would you say is the best, the best way to do it? So persuade someone who's got money to come and work for you and invest in you at the same time and offer to pay them back. So the, one of the things I want to do, uh, you know, we're all, we've all got EI, probably all EIS or SEIS um, qualifying businesses, or most of you. If you don't know what it is, go and Google it. It's a really important thing to investors. It's about tax relief on their investment. Um, and SEIS is really, really nice because you get 50% of your money back as an investor when you invest, right? So that's a, a really good thing. So go and find someone who is a high rate taxpayer, who's got skills that you need uh, and is willing to pay for their entry into your business. And there will be people like that around. So you charge them, you give them the opportunity. So you're selling something that they want. And they want to find businesses like yours that they're interested in or believe in or they believe in you or whatever um, and charge them for the privilege of potentially taking part in, the, in Edinburgh's best startup, you know. So, uh, and don't be shy of asking them, you know. So I would like to, if I take someone on um, an additional, not founder, but an advisor or something to the board, I would expect them to invest in a company and to be paid after that. So the investment for these guys is really straightforward. They, they pay money into you, they get some tax relief on it, and then they earn the money that they've invested back. But what they've done is invest in you. And you know, that's a great thing to take. So investors are, um, 
and I, I, I used to say this with derision before I was an investor, that they're sheep and now I bleat and go bah, because every, everybody wants to invest alongside other people. And it gives you a good feeling when someone that you know or trust is investing. So people like to do things in groups, you know, and, uh, um, and so find, I would say to you, there's, there's a host of people out there. There's masses of people out there and they attend events like this and they've got a bit of time on their hands or they've got um, some spare cash and they want to give, you know, they want to give something back. You'll hear that a lot from them. So go and find them uh, and make sure they give you it first. Huh? So the so what about a founder who needs a software developer uh, but can't you know doesn't necessarily want to give them equity in the company but wants to pay them to be the first hire software developer when they're the solo founder you know paying first hires I mean that is a that's a strategy that other people are thinking about um, but if you haven't got much money it's a real challenge. Yeah, it would be. Um, so you have to find their salary, and if they're rubbish, what do you do? Um, I, don't, I mean, it's... Yeah. I mean, if you know the person, and you're comfortable working with them, and you know their skills are there, then it's a great hire, you know? Um, but if you, if they, their skills are just on a, a CV, or, you know, someone's recommended them, <laughs> you know... You try and do as much as you can before, and let investors take the risk. So you know, before you spend your hard-earned, um, try and uh, do as much of it as you can um, before, and let someone else take the risk of hiring someone. You hire a good software developer in Edinburgh. I mean, I'm not super familiar with it, but you're not going to be paying them less than forty-five thousand a year to do that, and probably more than that. So you know, if any user's got forty-five grand to spend on a, a software developer, you know, come and see me at the end of this because I would need you as an investor, please. So. <laughs> so what we're talking about here is the team and I know that investors always want to invest in a good uh, performing team. And in your experience, how do you know whether a team is a good investment or not? Sure. Um, yeah, so uh, that's, yeah, so you only ever see people as an investor on their best behaviour, and that's really difficult. Uh, that makes it really difficult. Um, so you might meet them, you might see the pitch, you might talk to them a few times, and you might have a more formal meeting where you, you get into the guts of the business a little bit more. Um, so what I personally look for is people who have faced some adversity and changed and being able to adapt their business uh, to, to to meet that, um, because whilst you need to be really single-minded to drive a business forward and to be very focused on the output, you also need to recognise when it's time to change. And so I look for that in people. I look for teams that are diverse, so they're not just everybody's not just got six letters after their name. I saw a pitch uh, a few months ago. Uh, from a uni spin out and every single person had like a dozen letters after their name and I'm thinking well who's going to sell anything from that business you know so who's going to fix real world problems and deal with people in that business you know none of these people well you know I mean that's a judgment and you know I mean it's, I might be completely wrong but it's uh, you know how do you make that angel investors don't give too much you know it's a gut Certainly for me, it was a bit of a gut feeling uh, on a lot of them. And I like to see a team that is diverse, is um, has faced some challenges. <clears throat> um, and I like to see the quality of the idea. And if I believe in the idea and the team, then I think it would be, you know, it's a pretty good mix. That's great. That's great advice. And the, so the, so the behavior that the entrepreneur needs to embrace is one off, off, uh, well, I mean, it is a challenge to pursue an idea that you think is a world-class idea, but then to let go of that idea and to actually consider something else. It's um, it's really difficult to do that. Uh, I think startup land, we call it pivoting. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, it, it, but you have to recognise when it's time to do that. So you have to, you know, be flexible. 
or appear to be flexible. So you, mm. you have to, you know, um, yeah, I mean, you could be really single-minded and you, you'll listen to a lot of people who say, I was totally single-minded, I didn't move and I made a billion dollars, or and that's great, you know. Um, but mm. they're, in the world of exceptions, they're exceptional, you know, so they're most people, <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a huge amount of luck, absolutely, in business. You know, you can do all the right things. This is a real tragedy. You can be sitting there on the best idea in the world and you can do all the right things and you could be in a great position like I was in 2008 and then Lehman Brothers crash and you know your world gets turned upside down and the money that you've spent on your business startup just pisses out the door because of some guys in America and there's nothing you can do about it. Mm. So you know you have to be you know and the tragedy is you have to be just lucky as well. You have to do the right things and if you're doing the right things and you're lucky then you know you stand a chance. I get the, the, the impression that you, you you've definitely been in it for the long term. You're so you you're you're working with people that you've known for a while. You've you've been through the trenches. You've got your war stories. You've never given up. You're you know you're <laughs> you're persevering. And other people must look at you. Other other uh, other entrepreneurs, other investors, and. I'm mad. I'm mad. Why am I doing this? I'd say, I look at myself and I say, why am I doing this? I mean, I wake up in the morning, some mornings, and, you know, like today and yesterday, Federico and I are going through contracts. God, it's dull, you know, and it's really hard work and it's just so boring. Um, and then there's other days that you're, you know, you just think, Christ, why is nobody getting this? Is it ever going to happen? What the hell am I doing this? Why am I working at nine o'clock on a Sunday night when I don't need to? Why am I doing this? And for what reason? You know, so, yeah, I mean, I, I face all those things. And it's funny, you, you know, it's because I'm not, you know, God, I can't, I can't believe it. I can never say this, but yeah, I'm not, obviously, clearly not that motivated by money. You know, it's not, that's not what's, what's working me now and most of you probably aren't you think you are and you know that's what I thought I was yeah I just worked to, to you know I, I, I wanted to make money you know my, my original aim in my last business was to make enough money to pay my mortgages off um, you know and that was a just so that I didn't have to uh, work as a you know be a career person after that um, you know, and I, I, I don't know, it's just, um, you're not probably motivated by money, you think you are, and you, you're probably just a workaholic, or you just want to work, and you want to focus on a task, and I, I think that's that's me. So, it's, uh, so well, I guess the, th the three motivators are mastery, purpose, and what's the other one? Uh, well, it's gone blank now, mastery, purpose, autonomy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Autonomy, and I would imagine that all three of those are a yeah. play in, in what motivates you. Yeah, I, I, I like the purpose element of what I'm doing now. I didn't, you know, you hear a lot of people, and yeah, I want to give something back, and you know, stuck my fingers down my throat when I heard that often in the past. But um, and that's not uh, that's not a motivation. I don't want to give something back. I want to make a shit ton of money and know that when every pound I make is doing good. That's a much better way to do it, I think. I'm not a traditional tree hugger, but I do hug trees now. Um, autonomy is, I have never, ever been an easy hire for people. And I, you know, sometimes I look back and I feel sorry for people that I've worked for because I was never easy to work with. Um, the mastery, I think, is the last one. And one of the hardest things I've found is always a subject, you know, I think when I first left, I worked for a big blue chip organisation, a company called Slumbergy, subject matter expert. And I, you know, people would fly me around the world to talk to them about this, that and the other. Um, you know, and I left that and and I wasn't a subject matter expert anymore. And that is kind of scary to start with. And then it gets <coughs> interesting because you become one. And, you, you know, through the iterations that I've been through, I think I've realised that, you know, a lot of the skills I learned 
are very transferable and uh, you know I, I'm really enjoying now actually becoming a subject matter expert in uh, in in the new business that I'm in. I didn't know anything about the energy business three years ago. Wow. Um, Google and Wikipedia and especially YouTube have taught me massively. But you know I mean I go and sit and talk to Ian Marchant, the ex-CEO of Scottish and Southern Energy, and he is an energy expert. And you know, Ian thinks what we're doing is good, and he doesn't tell me I'm wrong. You know, so you'd be amazed what you can learn on YouTube. So, how did you originally come up with the idea then for Box G? Uh, that's a good idea. Good question. Um, put solar on the roof. Uh, in 2015. Is this your own house? My own house. Um, and I was amazed it worked in Scotland. <laughs> Jenny, my wife, she wanted to do it and I was a bit sceptical. I thought it's never going to work in Scotland. Um, and it was amazing to see it generating power and then I realised, Christ, I've given this power away to the grid. Why am I doing that? It's my power. I want it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it was. I went through a period where I was fascinated by this meter in our house and then I got a bit bored with that. But I made an investment in a company called Sunamp, um, which you make heat batteries, um, and I bought an electric car, um, and I started to get really interested in batteries. I spent a lot of time. I read a book actually called um, uh, Clean Disruption by a guy called Tony Seba, and that changed my life and probably made me think that this is this is it. And what he talked about was. How transformation, uh, the big transformation that's happening in energy and um, the knock-on effects into transport. Excuse me. Um, and I realised with that, the solar, the EV, the sun and heat batteries, there was something to be done. And then I read about. I mean, I'm really a geek, you know. I was reading about the Scottish energy government energy policy, and heat was the hardest thing to uh, to turn green. And you know, if you want to start a business, do it in something that nobody else is focused on, you know. And so customers, people don't like to talk to customers, you know. So you say you're in a B2C play and they, they go, oh, you know, I'm not sure we're in a B2C. They prefer business to business. I like B2C. I've not been a B2C uh, person. I don't have any, any experience in it. But I like it because there, um, there's 23 million potential customers out there. And, you know, and I can ask them through Facebook now. So it's quite easy to reach those customers uh, quickly and you can get an awful lot of no's and a lot of doors slammed in your face um, for a few a few thousand quid. But you know you only have to pick up a few yeses and Facebook does that for you. So um, yeah, um, yeah, lots of thread there. Get no well, it was, so it was just through your own curiosity, your own, you, just, you saw an opportunity that yeah. really excited you. Yeah. And you decided to, and then you came. So then you came up with the idea of a heat exchange. Yeah. So I mean, I saw the take. I saw the marriage of. Um, I saw where batteries were going, and something called experience curves, and we've all heard the one called Moore's law, I'm sure, which is talks about the cost of computing and the power of computing, uh, and there's there's Moore's laws equivalents in batteries and uh, and in uh, heat pumps. And I started to think in this non-linear way, I thought about, okay, that's the price today, but I believe the price is going to be there in the future. And when, it's, when, you, when you map it out and you follow that curve down the way, then you start to say, oh, man, this is really going to change everything. And the biggest industries in the world that's going to change is energy and transport. And those are, you know, if you think the, the disruption caused by the financial crash was big, well, these industries are bigger than it. You know, both the, in, individually they're bigger, and together they're absolutely gargantuan. And so, in disruption, in this change, is opportunity for small businesses. And you know, that's where I want to be. I want to be in that mix, that turbulent water, where things are changing, and we come up with an idea, and somebody's desperate to, to either hold on to their life or change their business. So they go around buying little companies. And that's what they do. That's, so that's the opportunity for Boxergy is was to, to be that little company. It's in the right space. The technology is there. It's accessible. You know, I mean, a lot of this happened over a long time. It wasn't an instant. I didn't have it fully formed. It, it came to me over over time, and it's evolved since that time. We've 
wouldn't say we've pivoted away from our core idea, but it's certainly got a lot more polished. I like to think that um, the, there's a price that we have to pay to be successful, or to you know to to build a successful company. Would you agree with me that you have, there's a price that each of us has to pay? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, as from my own experience, uh, you know, in Aberdeen, we started the business in 2011 and we grew it to um, from nothing to 16 and a half million turnover in three years um, and we hired 48 people um, and I quit the end of 2014 uh, and it was I was really really tired it was really really hard work it was uh, just time to move on um, it, it had taken a lot out of me a lot of time away from my family in 2011 my family moved down to Edinburgh and I was commuting to Aberdeen uh, and that's Aberdeen's yeah it's all right you know but it's not uh, home it's not where my girls were so it was um, you know there was that part of it um, you know, you give what you're going to give, you know, and some people, I, I, it, there was some circumstances that caused uh, my own journey to be extremely difficult at the end, and I learned that just what I'll do for that financial independence that I was going for, um, you know, and it was, it, it was quite a lot um, in the end, um, but, you know, I mean, some people make it, and they make it by being much more... Um, level-headed so and or more equal with their time and I don't I don't believe in this uh, you know everybody you've got you definitely have to sacrifice some things I think so you have to make some accommodation to it because it can be at times all-encompassing so there are times when you prioritize the business over your personal life uh, and that can last for days or uh, months you know at times and that you know that sometimes doesn't fit in with kids that are growing up and you know, spouses. So the, uh, maybe just the last question for me before we open up to the room for other people who want to ask some questions. If we, th if we think about the business and uh, con you know consolidating your idea and then recruiting people into the team and you know trying to get investment, is there anything you would do differently in, in those in that space in hindsight? The team, I think, is you know the team was the journey it needed to go on, and and it took as long as it took. I think I'm very happy with the team and the the, the that point. I would do some things differently. We got lost chasing some grants, and we got some great feedback on some early grant applications we did. So we lost ourselves in it, and and you know God, it's a, lots of people have warned us not to do it, uh, and we didn't listen. Um, or more precisely, I never. Um, and we made some tactical mistakes on them, so I would go back and change that as aspect of it. I think um, I'd probably look for a more, a lighter touch uh, piece of technology that I could have done earlier. Um, you know, and that's more attractive. A lot of investors don't want to spend a lot of money on uh, big lumps of kit, so you know a smaller controller or something might have been easier to do. Mm. Okay, well thanks for that. I do appreciate um, no you being candid with us uh, there. So, does anybody have a question they'd like to ask Jim um, in the room? What's your go to market strategy? Go to market strategy for Boxer is to convert some of the 400 uh, expressions of interest that we have, so we spent a lot of time talking to customers. Um, so we individuals? Were individuals, yeah, that we recruited through Facebook. It was also to work and capitalise on the the people we've, we've partnered up with an energy company called Octopus Energy. Um, you know, after a few uh, demonstrators are put in, they'll probably market our technology to their 600,000 customers. So we're going to stick in Scotland, though. We're going to stick in the central belt of Scotland. That's the easiest thing to manage for us. Um, and we want to, to be cautious in the way we scale. 
because what we're really doing in the first couple of years is just to design the cookie cutter that we're going to go out and do it. We want to get that, that part of it right. And then when you go to the housing developers? <coughs> so housing developers, private developers are, uh, you know, it's a minimum cost thing. So what we do is deliver benefit over time and the two are incompatible. So what we can do though, uh, and what we're exploring is ways to, for them to monetize um, so what I've learned and recently, sorry, we're long-winded here, but housing developers are looking to even out their cash flow. Uh, they tend to do big projects where it involves a lot of upfront investment, and then they get the money back, and you know it's feast or famine for them. Uh, so a few of them have been talking about how we, how they smooth out their cash flow, and I've talked to them about owning their roofs and owning the heating systems that they put in the buildings and selling the heat uh, as a service. And if they own the roof, they can put solar on the roof then they'll be incentivized to have a nice south facing roof that's got lots of room for solar and then they put they sell the heat to the, their customers and they generate the heat from the solar and in the summer they sell the heat the electricity to their to their customers or sell it to another party uh, we've done the same with uh, we're talking to uh, registered social landlords housing associations about the same sort of thing how does the lease model work for the uh, home user so do they have to pay Normally you buy a boiler up front, how does that work? So yeah, and that, that lease model is, is, is a few years away. What we want to do is to work on our costs and get them down to a level um, where we think in three or, well, four, four or five years time, we should be at a point where we can uh, give the boiler for less, give the, 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 the system for less than a gas boiler and operate it for less. If we can attract the right capital, then it will just be, you know, uh, we can give it for much less and, you know, um, and charge much less. And that's just about patient capital or finding someone who wants to, who's willing to wait longer for the return on investment. But you can imagine it just like a mobile phone where, and it, you know, ultimately we just want to say, okay, you want a box of your system, it's 50 quid a month. You know, you can switch your lights on all the time. And, you know, it's not a great message to sell into the green space, but it's 50 you know, 50 quid a month for X amount of electricity and X amount of heat, you know, and use as much as you want up to that limit and pay for extra after. So a lot like a mobile phone. Uh, I live in Canada quite, quite a lot. Um, we can't keep exchanges are big there, um, very successful. Uh, big up front costs, I don't know whether the lease model was there. Um, that over the long term, you, you can get your money back. So it's been around for quite a while. Why isn't it? Why haven't people adopted the exchange businesses? Because in, in the UK we can buy gas at four or three pence a kilowatt hour and electricity costs 14 pence and even with a great uh, two and a half to one exchange it's still more expensive. So gas is, we've been blessed or cursed with North Sea gas in the 70s and everybody changed over to, North, to, to gas and if I did a, asked everybody in the room to tell me uh, who, who thought electricity was, it was cheaper to heat your home with electricity or gas, most I'm going to guess every single one of you would say it was cheaper to heat it with gas. That's a perception that is, was right and is now wrong. And it's wrong because energy, you can buy energy at different times of the day and if you can buy energy at different times of the day, you can pay less for it. Um, so we need to hit a price of 10p a kilowatt hour and then we're cheaper than the cheapest gas to sell heat to people, and we can do that fairly straightforwardly. Is, it, is this all, it's proven technology you're using? Here? Yeah, you can buy the heat pump with a seven year manufacturer's warranty, a 10 year manufacturer's warranty on electric battery, and seven year on the... What's the barrier to somebody else just coming straight in? So that, that's a good question, and that's why Jamie's our CTO. So, you know, strangely, no one has actually put them all on the same uh, electrical connection before. So we've got some IP, we've, we did an IP audit um, and I'd encourage everybody to do an IP audit plus which is you'll get a Scottish Government grant for two and a half grand and you'll get an IP company, we chose Marks and Clarks, that will look at your ideas and tell, talk about the patent landscape and look for patentable features of it. And they, they identified six patentable features, we've since identified a seventh. We spent four and a half grand on securing um, uh, three of those um, ideas with, um, what's it, uh, just trying to, try to get the terminology right here, um, priority dates. So that's, uh, you know, we don't have to do much, we don't have to do anything else for a year, uh, but we've, we've 
talked about an embodiment, we've talked about an invention, if you like, and we've said that's what it is. And so we can sit on that for a year, not spend any more money, 18 months actually. Um, but it's as good, you know, we're not going to get a patent issued before our investment. And, right. you know, it so takes no, ages no, to do it. So. Maybe the Apple model will make it very easy to use for people. So, well, we, we, we've actually got the uh, fe features patented that will stop, if we get them granted, will stop people putting them all in one box. So putting them all in one box is really important to us because it simplifies the installation. So when you get a gas boiler replaced, you don't get a team of people coming around measuring your windows and checking the size of your radiators and doing a thorough energy assessment of your house. You get your mate round if you've got a plumber mate or you get a guy who's from Yellow Pages and, and they come in and say, okay, you've got a boiler of that size, right? We've got another one and the pipes are coming out in that configuration. They go and buy one that looks like your old gas boiler and it's the same size. That's where we need to be uh, when we do this. And when you're at that level, it needs to come in one box. So that's, our prote that's one of our protections. There's other protections that we've got that I'm less comfortable talking about at the moment, but you know, I mean, uh, it's amazing what you can patent around it. And it's, it's actually quite a, um, quite a sparse patent landscape at the moment. That's what we've found. So another question over here? No, over there then? Um, when does it break even for uh, 2022, I think we break even. It depends on uh, how many units we're selling, it depends on the business model we're using and our costs. So it's a bit of a uh, fantasy, to be honest, at that, le at that time. But, you know, we're focused on reducing our costs. But we're a tech company, so, you know, I talk about positive margins rather than break even points uh, generally. If we change our business model in 2022 to be in a lease model, then our break-even points further out. Um, but if we continue to sell our product, then it's you know a question of how big is our organisation, what's the margin on the product. But as I said, we're a tech company, so we're going to be investing in the future, and you know so necessarily we'll have a higher overhead than a plumbing business would have. So that that could push us out further, depending if we're still investing in that or not. Okay, Tom. Yeah. You just said uh, when you were talking about the co-founders uh, co that you search for people who already have money and they, they want to invest, right? Yeah. But is that only because you want them to be able to pay them uh, or to have them their own salary or also because you want them to put skin in the game and uh, you want to have like a, a proven track record because if they make money, it's more likely that they already gained some success. Yeah, and I, I think the answer is to all of those, yes. You want, so you're presenting in front of people with money and they want to give you your money. They, they genuinely do. I mean, I've sat there, I want to give my, to invest my money. Um, you know, they're much more likely to do it if they've got a, someone they know or someone that has made money for someone else before and has a more proven track record. You know, I mean, if you're a, if you're a, if you've been successful in business already, then you know they'll give you more leeway. Um, look too successful, you know. So if all your co-founders have had exits, that's fantastic. Um, and if they're all got, if they've all got the money, not to need a salary, that's even better, you know. So it's, it keeps you lean, gets them in the business, um, and just makes you look more attractive because they're looking for a team. So you, you've got an idea. I'm not an expert in your idea. I, 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 yeah, if it's anything to do with the internet or phones and apps and that, I, I just don't know what it is, right? So I'm looking for people to that you know can explain it, the business to me in in a way, not the technical side of it. And if I see someone who's been in that space, who's built an app and had an exit, or the, you know they built it for someone else and made money, some money themselves, then that's great. You know I can trust them. And there's a bunch of those people out there looking, you know, wanting startups. So you've had an idea, um, and they're stuck in the rut, and they're, they're looking for that opportunity. So hopefully we get more of them coming here. <laughs> yeah. Okay, one more question from this side of the room, and then we'll call it time. Does anybody have a question? didn't answer my question about skin in the game. Oh, okay, we'll go back to Tom as the last question then. It's a skin in the game, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. nothing more, yeah. there's nothing more sincere than money. 
to an investor. <laughs> you know, I mean, if someone's willing to put money, then you know, then then they, then they really believe in what you're doing. You know. Yeah, is it also a right motivation that's actually like a, a yeah. negative no, no, it's a uh, positive. in the sense of when, when you lose, they lose because they lose their money? Yeah. So it's, it's alignment. I think you, I would call it alignment. So, you know, if, you're, if you have got a co-founder who just likes to talk to their friends about helping a startup but hasn't invested in anything in it and doesn't have any, you know, if it fails, they don't lose anything, then, you know, that's just somebody standing on the sidelines, you know. But someone who, um, you know, what you really want is someone who's going to lose a, a tangible amount of money uh, if you fail. So then they'll be super motivated to make sure you don't fail um, and they will go that extra mile, you know. If it's just someone who's given their time uh, at, on the sidelines, then it's not as important to them. So I think it's important that they put money in. Okay, thanks. Okay, we're going to end there then. So please join me in thanking Jim.